So I'm Susanna. Uh, I was at Fitz from 2014 to 2017 and I studied English. Um, currently, I'm a final seat trainee solicitor for the chance. Um, <laughs> hopefully, I'll go on to be an associate shortly, but we'll see what happens in February. Cool. So I'm Titio de Somwo. I uh, matriculated in 2014, graduated in 2017. I studied law, unlike Savannah Rat, who don't practice <laughs> law. Um, apologies, Nikki. Um, I am a international development consultant and an entrepreneur. So we just want to start at the beginning. So we want to figure out like what your journey to Cambridge was like, what kind of school you went to, what your first um, conceptions were about Cambridge and how you ended up there ultimately. So if you start again, Savannah. The youth, I'll start with the school I went to when I refined Cambridge. Um, I went to sixth form and part of high school um, in Luton. As I went to Luton Sixth Form College, which is like one of two big colleges in Luton. Um, as I went to Luton Sixth Form College, there were, I know it wasn't my year, there were a few of us who decided we wanted to go to kind of the very best universities. So kind of we're all friends and band together and decided, hey, we're going to try to apply for Oxford and Cambridge. Um, just being, despite the fact that people didn't really go to Oxford and Cambridge from our sixth form college, but we were just quite keen and Jenny had these grades and really wanted to kind of do the best that we could. Um, so I, I think my first aspiration wasn't in Cambridge, it was in going to Oxford because that's the only thing I vaguely heard of because we had someone come down to and do a talk at the college at Oxford, which I had to sneak into, so I wasn't actually invited to it. <laughs> um, and you know, after the talk, I thought, hey, Oxford sounds nice, but I kind of want to learn about the other one. Um, and so I kind of just did some research into Cambridge colleges, um, and you know, we had the open days that we did in summer, and so I decided. I, I'm trying to remember why I decided fits, and I think I wanted something that wasn't really old. Specifically, I didn't want a, a really old stuffy building. I wanted something that's kind of modern, um, and that kind of fit the bill. And you know, what I read on there, everything's funny enough. So I, I went to an open day. Um, really got on with the college. The open day, I talked to one of the. English fellows, uh, Tessia Body. I don't know if she's still a fellow of it, but she was when I was there when I studied. And I talked to her, and we got on really well. She gave me her email address, and she said, "You know, contact me if you need anything." Um, and I did, and I was still quite keen on fits in Cambridge, and so I just decided to apply to Cambridge. And I was fortunate enough to get an interview, and then to get an offer after that. Um, everyone at my sixth form was very surprised because again people didn't really go to Cambridge from my sixth form um, I think they thought the interview process was like just terrifying and I had the most awful mock interview at my college that I've ever had anywhere where I was shouted at for an hour because they thought that was what happened with the Cambridge interview. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was very strange but I, I, I got my offer um, and I you know went to FITS. Um, I actually Slightly, I was slightly missing my offer, but also exceeding it. And then I was kind of very panicky on like the day and um, results day. But I got a letter that morning, which was Fitz basically saying, you know, you slightly missed your offer, but actually we really want you to come anyway. So come on in. <laughs> and it was great, obviously, because everyone knows the panicky feeling on A level results day, especially if you log into UCAS and you think, oh God, like what's going to happen? Um, so, you know, I got in and um, that was kind of actually how I got to Cambridge. I just, you know, had teachers who supported me and believed in me and an English teacher who really, really wanted me to go to Cambridge as well and like really encouraged me to do well on coursework and everything. And it just fit specifically was just the friendly college I really wanted to go to that wasn't, didn't seem pretentious as a state school student. It didn't seem kind of, you know, terrifying or a bit strange it felt like somewhere I could fit in um, and so that's kind of how I was applying to it and Cambridge I, I think I've forgotten half of the question did that cover most of the, most of the yeah, no, I think I think that was really good <laughs> overview if you want to continue I think 
I don't remember consciously saying I want to go to Cambridge. I don't, I, if it happened, I'm just not cognizant of it. But I kind of feel like I fell into it. That's really pathetic to say. But I just think that I have just generally in my walk of life been really set on excellence and kind of being the very best version of myself and attaining what I can within my circumstances. And um, yeah, I went to a grammar school just outside of Croydon. So as much as Oxbridge wasn't the most common thing. There were people in the years prior that went probably about for the year before me to Oxbridge. And then in my year, I think we were quite, we were almost 10. It was quite a lot of us. Um, so yeah, I kind of knew that it wasn't absolutely foreign, but I was also conscious of the fact that it would require a lot of me. Um, and so I kind of um, just applied. I, I think I applied to, um, I think I applied to Cambridge specifically for very, again, pathetic reasons. I went to Oxford and it was raining really heavily and I just thought this is bad vibes. And so I so what happened to me, the one time I went to Oxford, it was raining. And I was it like, was this raining. Is- yeah. And it was as simple as that. It's just intuitive. Sometimes you just don't know. And so obviously, I don't know if that's still the case, but at the time you could either apply for Oxford or Cambridge. And so... You know, I, I went to, uh, I think it was a Peterhouse Law Summer School or something. I went to quite a few of those summer schools uh, prior to applying. And it was nice weather. It was also the summer, but hey, you know. Um, and so I thought I'd go for it. And I had a really encouraging sick form and a really encouraging head of year who was like, yeah, go for it. Um, and so I knew that I could attain the grades. I just wasn't sure about the interview. And I actually, sorry, Fitz, I applied for Downing and was pulled to Fitz. Okay, uh, let's just get it out there. Um, I initially had to apply for Downing because, uh, you know, I'd read all the stuff about Downing being the law college. Um, and I was, and I had that interview and it went well, but obviously not good enough. So I was pulled to fits and I had another set of interviews, uh, which went really well. And that's when I began my, my love story with Nikki Padfield. Um, and so, yeah, obviously that went well enough. Um, and I started at fits. I think, um, In hindsight, having obviously entertained conversations uh, with other people from other colleges, so elated I went to Fitz because it's the most similar thing to back home, aesthetically and actually, in terms of like the demographic of students. Um, But also it's been renovated significantly now that you guys are here. So maybe I'm talking absolutely too hard, I don't know. But um, yeah, it was nice. Like my closest friend um, was from really local to me, Crystal Palace, South London. Um, And yeah, Fitz definitely had, at least at the time I was there, a demographic that just made the the whole culture feel less isolating. So, yeah, that was my journey to Fitz, and I'm very grateful uh, for the pooling system because I prefer Fitz kids anyway to Downing. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we like the college, like the ties to the college. The college loyalty is very strong at Cambridge. Yes, and after you graduated, obviously. Mm. <laughs> I still use my Fitz graduation pen, and it's five years old, so or three. I'm three. surprised it hasn't run out. Yeah, you know what? See, that's There's something about strength. it. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay, so now moving on to when you're actually at Cambridge, you've moved in and you've like spent a bit of time there. What were some of your favourite places to be in Cambridge? Were you part of any societies? Or was your favourite space just like hang out with friends in a kitchen? That's what me and Leona did. A lot of other people have said that that was their favourite mm. thing to do. So um, Savannah, do you want to start? What were your favourite spaces? Um, favourite spaces? I mean, one thing I got involved in in a big way is the creative writing scene at Cambridge. So that's kind of the biggest thing I did. And I am... Um, wrote for and then became the editor of, I don't know whether it's still there, I think it is, of like Notes magazine and so I kind of ran that for a while and that it started at Fitz and then became like a general university kid writing magazine and so I ran that like across my second and third years and wrote for it a lot and did a lot of creative writing um, and then aside from that um, in terms of some DME spaces I was a member of Fuse which I think had just yes. started I think yeah. it just started when I was uh, like literally I think in my first year like, they just had created it um and yeah so I was like a member of that along with friends from the colleges and so I didn't really I wasn't really too much a part of ACS or of the main LGBT society but I, like Fuse was kind of like the main point that I did get involved in and it was just like informing because like watching some films with friends and having a chat and grabbing a coffee 
um, but you know, it linked in with other uni LGBT people around university, and that it's just really nice to have that space to like both be express a space where I could like, write creatively, and I really enjoyed just running a magazine and having a great editorial team. Um, but it's also nice to have this uni slash LGBT space, um, especially again for like my first year, having a space where I could come out, but where like it wasn't a wildly weird thing and it still took into account like the fact that I was uni and like what that meant in the context of an LGBT space. And it was nice to have some of those discussions with people who understood and who had that same experience. Um, I think in terms of like in society, the Oxford were definitely like my favourite spaces in Cambridge. Titi, you talked about um, how Fitz kind of felt like home. Were there any other spaces in Cambridge that you kind of got that sense of community? Yeah, so um, I was I was part of quite a few things, uh, particularly my first and second year. As you will find out, Tolu, law is real. Okay, so it's going to kick in. So you will have to be a bit more That's discerning fair. with what you can engage in. But first year, I was a part of... Um, the Cambridge, that first or second year, I was part of the Cambridge Women Speak Out campaign, um, which was essentially the, uh, it was surrounding um, International Women's Day and it was a photography campaign and I was kind of Fitz, the Fitz organisation team lead, which was really cool and it was just an opportunity to, essentially the, the actual campaign visually um, was essentially photos of uh, masters and lecturers and students um, with statements on their bodies. So, um, I am not my hair or I am not validated by the size of my boobs or whatever it might be. It was just a, a kind of feminist campaign in and around that. And it was really cool to kind of, uh, spearhead fits the side of that. And, um, I, I, it's nice. I get like a reminder from Facebook ever so often and you see images, um, and it ended up being a uni wide campaign, uh, both for Cambridge and ARU, which was really cool. Um, and then I was also a huge part of the um, ACS in my first year. Um, for me, it was just affirming to see other black and brown people who uh, were attaining academic excellence and didn't conform to the stereotypes you see projected all over the news. And it was just a really nice vibe, lots of people from London. Uh, prior to actually joining, there was an ACS or a BAME meetup in central London. So prior to even coming, I knew quite a few faces. And of course, um, there was lots of cohesion there. So that was really nice. Um, and yeah, the reality of it, it is, is, I mean, at FITS, Savannah and I were one of, I believe, 10 out of 400 in the year, black students. Uh, I literally look at the uh, matriculation picture each year and nine of us, 10 of us matriculated, nine of us graduated. Um, and so it was really affirming to actually have a space where you didn't feel so isolated because the reality of it is going to lectures, you, you are, you know, just the one. And so, yeah, I really, really savoured that experience and I savoured that warmth and really enjoyed that as well. Um, yeah, so that was nice. Uh, the Fly Network, I'm not sure whether, you, whether it's still operating, yeah. but for the meets I went there, it was really cool to kind of see the kind of elders, so to speak, you know, third years who are, you know, just unapologetically themselves and really campaigning and making moves. So that was a really cool space as well. I joined so many things that I ended up like not committing to in the end. I remember I was part of like Why is that me? basketball team. <laughs> oh, sure. oh, I was basketball Every team, time. football. I, I was in Fitz football. Um, <laughs> I was rookie of the year. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that um, in terms of like the, the women's campaigns and the BAME campaigns, that's what really just was kind of like a home away from home for me. And yeah. in terms of just like being just the one and being in predominantly white spaces, Savannah, what was your experience of being a black student in those spaces? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, like as soon as you get to Cambridge, you're, you know, as like a student from Mesh Energy, you're aware that like most of the Cambridge is white, like most of the student body is white, and that's just that's just readily apparent. Um, mm. And then you do. Like, so there's a thing where some, like, from the most part, in terms of actually interacting with people, you know, it wasn't an issue. Some people were a bit ignorant. I remember having a conversation with, like, friends that, you know, I'm still friends with and I value, um, but they had, they had no idea about the history of black people in the UK, 
um, someone thought that like literally every person who's black in the UK had descended from slaves in the UK, and then I had to explain, explain that no, that's that's not the case, and actually like there's this completely different history, and maybe like bringing in some stereotypes you have about like black Americans in the US that like you're kind of wrong basically, and it it was there was definitely sometimes a gap in terms of what we knew about like black experiences. Um, sometimes you had I, I never had like any like a racism or anything I can remember. Um, I do remember like every now and then an uncomfortable experience. Um, I remember once going on what was it? You know, the, like the parenting system that they do in colleges and everything. I think I was part of like the RVG um, parenting system, and so I like went for dinner with like my you know, brothers and sisters and like an extended family of parents. And then one in the one of the parents, who was a guy, like made a joke about like he made, it wasn't even a joke. He made a comment about having seen a black girl and said, "Oh, I don't see black girls much." Then he realized he said the word black, and he looked at me and he's like, "I'm so sorry." And I was like, "What?" And he's like, "I wasn't trying to offend you." I was like, "What? It's just if you use the word black. It's not racist. Oh you're more uncomfortable. You're making it uncomfortable by bringing attention to it." Oh and sometimes we came across people who just kind of had never really interacted with people who were black, and it wasn't necessarily because mm. they're white. It's like a variety of things, like where they lived in the UK and like. Just fishy coincidences of going to like a school where again there aren't many black people, and sometimes you get quite uncomfortable. Um, so yeah, it was it was interesting kind of navigating that space. Just people didn't often didn't always know how to kind of interact. You or would overact because they didn't really know what to do because they see someone who looks different to them. Oh God, like I've got to like change my behaviour, which is a, a bizarre thing. But we find that some students do do that. Um, but overall, it was actually quite nice with a lot of my friends, people who are white and who weren't white, with being able to talk to them about my experiences and like explaining things. And I, if something happened like in an offensive group, I always kind of stopped and like called people out when needed and explained things when needed because I'm not going to sit there while someone makes a stupid comment or says something that's just entirely wrong because they don't know any better. I'm going to tell them, okay, that's a dumb thing to say this is why and you shouldn't do that again um so yeah it was it was interesting for the most part i had like a you know amazingly positive experience at cambridge but occasionally there were uncomfortable times or just oddities i would say in, in the experience and so obviously you're part of the same like cohort so why your experience is similar in any way oh i think i think holistically my experience was positive i think in hindsight there are quite a few microaggressions that now that i'm a little bit more woke to it all i'm a bit more cognizant of them and i thought oh maybe i could have called that out maybe i could have stepped in the way of that um i do think there is one instance that stands out to me i was actually on my way to supervision so um i think most colleges um will partner with other colleges and have supervisions in other colleges um and so for this particular supervision i think it was my international law supervision and i won't name the college but obviously i'm running late uh, on my way to um this said college um to get through the, the the gates and go to my supervision and essentially i'm on my way it's not my first time there but my hair was different but of course it's different because i'm a multifaceted black woman who can change my hair when i please um, I didn't say that to the porter, unfortunately, who stopped me on my way and told me that um, visitors are only allowed entrance from 12pm. Uh, and evidently, I'm not a visitor. I paid £9,000 to be here. Um, and I think what really kind of, what made it difficult was that obviously, um, like the Fitz guys would go together as a collective and i'm there and they've all gone prior to me and i was suddenly stopped because my aesthetics didn't match someone who in their understanding was a student and that for me was the only experience that um kind of stands out to me um and i can remember um telling him i was a student and him demanding to see my student id um and thereafter i think recognizing how awkward the situation was they no longer allowed uh, students to just walk through the like general like from the the road on into the college and everyone had to go 
through the Porter's Lodge, um, which I guess was their way of kind of suggesting that it wasn't discriminatory. But that was my one instance that kind of said to me, wow, like you are in some ways an oddity, but more so there is purpose to your presence because um, maybe this is your kind of cross to bear and this is a kind of unfortunate experience and now you've got to go and talk about your essay that's not that great and you're already feeling rubbish. Um, but ultimately for the other people who will come prior, I need to teach that that porter that actually I'm not a visitor. I have earned my place here and I am due that respect and same welcome. So um, yeah, I think a lot of those experiences in hindsight um, were really character refining and I hope that um, thereafter, you know, other black girls or people of colour don't need to experience that. And yeah. a lot of the spaces that are kind of set up in Cambridge, all the cultural societies like ACS and Fuse and the BMU campaign, they're there to kind of show that black people exist in Cambridge and kind yeah. of have that sense of community. So um, I think, Savannah, you mentioned that you are quite involved in Fuse. So what was it like being part of like the first year of Fuse and were there any other spaces or communities that were set up during your time at Cambridge? Um, I kind of think I won't. I'm not sure that there were particularly others that were set up. I think Fuse was you know, at the time already quite like a big thing because I don't think there really was any kind of proper society before. And it just happened that in my cohort there were quite a few of us who kind of had that intersection. Um, and so I think there were quite a lot of first years, from what I recall, who like joined Fuse, quite a lot of us, and we all kind of we all knew each other. So you had like the general, the main like LGBT society, but then a strong group of that who were kind of just few members. And I think again that had overlaps with um there definitely had overlaps with Fly and the gyms of like the Fly Girl group that were also in Fuse. Like, and um I think I did a few like reviews or like a very writing kind of as part of the few slash like Fly Girl group um memberships. But um this is the main thing and it was just as I like was saying earlier it was just really good to have kind of that space where you didn't feel like you were in an LGBT society and you were like the only like, non-white base there mm. um but then you also weren't in ACS or other community group but sometimes people are a bit more traditional and sometimes are like slightly typically feel a bit uncomfortable if you start talking about your like same sex partner and so you have that crossover and you can talk about you coming from a cultural background which doesn't necessarily accept things and people will understand and it's really nice to have that space really nice to have that conversation with someone else who understood um and i think it was just again good to have that representation good to have other people who were around that you didn't feel alone in that um which again very important as a minority in Cambridge where if you are a minority at any time, you kind of be an overwhelming majority. So it's always good to have that group where you can be yourself. Um, but even like while it wasn't necessarily a space for women I experience, I think when I was doing uh, working in notes and I was, I was there, we kind of had a conscious effort to try to when we were reviewing to review code pieces that I didn't own send them. We had like an effort to kind of examine like our own biases and we had like I think an editorial team that was like literally 50 percent minority, 60 percent white and it was good to have that because you know we all brought different experiences to the table and I think um I don't know how much other society tried to do that but I know that like when I was involved in society and I can't remember what they all were because again in first year you can't do so many things um it was always great to see that kind of representation or to see like a balance of things. I think I remember um, there being a push either in first or second year to really get more like same actors onto the Cambridge stage because like you just I think the theatre scene again like mostly white and there really being a huge push to try to get like more black actors, more black directors because that just wasn't really a thing and I don't know what the situation is like now but there pretty much were like no plays or anything but there was this amazing play um in my second or third year i'm trying to remember who wrote it up i think it was at least I'm trying to remember names but i think it was maybe one of the main actresses in it was called Cassia, 
can't remember what her surname was, but she was one of the few like gaming actors at the time, and she wrote it, and was in it, and it's just like a huge play because it's her the gaming actor is about being black in LGBT, um, in like white minority spaces, and that's just like such a rare thing. And I actually think that play, and I can't remember what it's called. I really can't right now, but it they performed it in Cambridge went on to a uh, stage in Edinburgh and then got it into like a theatre in London as well. So it's, it's like has seen great reviews. Um, I remember that being a really good play, which is amazing because you don't normally see those kinds of experiences. So overall, yeah, um, I just really valued having that intersection and having that area of representation here. So I, I'm actually a part of Fuse now and I'm um, Cambridge LD. LGBTQ plus officer. Um, so it's really interesting to see how things have changed and obviously FUSE had only just been started. So it'd be interesting um, to hear from both of you actually. So Savannah, from the perspective of like what kind of events were FUSE running at the time, just to have a comparison of like what's going on now. And then same to you to see of like, what did ACS, like what were the popular ACS events at the time that you enjoyed? Because this year ACS it's just growing every single year. There's so many more black students at Cambridge. Yeah. Year. And we literally normally have a house party, but the house was too small to fit all of us in. So we could barely have the house party. So it would just be interesting to hear like what um, kind of events were put on during your time with the ACS. Yeah, sure. So um, I can remember the first ACS ball. I think that came around in my second or third year. No. The first one I attended, they still existed, but one that could actually like take up space and be, you know, noticeable was in my second year, I think. Um, and yeah, that was really great. Obviously it was cross collegiate. You saw lots of uh, black people from all over um, Cambridge. And yeah, that was a really cool environment. You know, they, they the first, I will say, uh, I think Cambridge is learning, but I can remember the first dinner was held about a month into me being there and they made jollof rice with carrots it should do better um but i can remember there was a policy um there was a policy that in order to have uh, dinners um you couldn't bring in outside catering so obviously um the fitz canteen had resorted to some kind of jamie oliver recipe online not sure um but it was nice that they made an effort and we just laughed about it and didn't eat it. But it was great that they tried to kind of, you know, reach out to our culture. Um, maybe there needs to be diversifying of the staffing body. I don't know. But it was nice to kind of feel seen. And obviously they had to disrupt their, you know, regular programming in order to kind of make us feel more welcome and recognised, which was great. And then we had, and I don't know if it still existed, but I think it was called Culture Fest. Hmm. I'm going to say Culture Fest. Um, and that was cool. We had Mr. Silva, if you know who that was. Ooh, maybe not. So anyway, this, <laughs> this Afrobeat artist called Mr. Silva, and that year Missy and Aaron were um, president and co pres and yeah, they just did the best they could, um, particularly because there weren't that many Black people. And oftentimes, even though there were was a larger student Black body, there were also a huge number of black students who just didn't want to come to ACS that's the reality of it here you had a lot of people who I don't know I don't know what the reason reasoning was but you know I'd often like you know come to like town and be like oh my gosh hey you know you know and talking about the ACS and they're like oh yeah I'm not really keen on that kind of thing which was okay but for those who came there was a vibe for those who came there was a community and for those who came um those kind of contacts still stayed in place so the year after me you had Chelsea and Ore and Daniela come through and so they kind of were able to reap from that warm knit community that then existed then and I still see those girls all the time not all the time but from time to time um, and that is definitely a fruit of that but yeah it was definitely more socials we had the occasional like pizza night movie night um, Heather was the prez before before Nissi and she did a fantastic job so did Sogo and um, yeah mainly like just chatting eating um, we had, uh, they had a little partnership with the Nando's, um, on, I think it's Catherine Street, whatever the center, center town Nando's was, so we're always in Nando's. Um, yeah, so it was that kind of thing, lots of food, lots of, lots of positive 
vibes and um yeah i definitely appreciate that i really appreciate the um acs and uh, most of the people who i still speak to are from the acs the occasional person outside of that maybe someone who i who was on my floor or you know someone who i got on with in lectures but predominantly the acs was really my kind of you know community in cambridge that's amazing to hear. And then Savannah, if you could just expand a bit more on like Fuse and maybe some of the other um, spaces for LGBTQ plus people, because I know that it is quite a difficult intersection because already the queer community is maybe smaller than average. But then if you add being black or a person of colour on top of that, then it's just like a tiny. So <laughs> what was that like, like navigating um, that? Because I know it's kind of tough sometimes. Yeah, so I mean, so again, to Fuse, that just started my first year, I think it's quite small. I'm trying to think, I don't think we're more than like, maybe like 15 to 20 people, at least in the second year, and going into third year, like it slowly got bigger, but it was always quite a small group. So um, in terms of like events, like mostly what we would do is we'd like just gather for like, um, we'd like a keep doing film night and trying to like focus on like, that inter intersectional films and stuff, and like you know, Paris is burning and that kind of thing. Um, you'd also kind of like go in groups to, to some of the like LGBT club nights, especially because like most of us were from like field holders or ones near the city. And at that time, it was my first and second year, the best LGBT club night was like past the train station. So it was like oh, quite wow. a trek. It was like ages away. So you'd go in, like a pack just because you don't want to go like having on your own and especially when it's dark um, so we'd always go together um, so event wise we didn't do that more kind of having like communities for me to just chat with in like doing lectures um, I don't know what it is but being an English student but like a huge population of English students at Cambridge are LGBT so <laughs> we'd often see each other lectures and stuff like a huge population of English students um, so we'd see each other at lectures and we'd like meet up for like a drink or whatever and like just grab lunch together so it's more about having just that social connection so you can hang out with people and I saw like a couple of people from Fuse and I talked to them and like did some size with them so there were a few hundreds like in notes as well and so we'd hang out there and we'd hang out like in a film night and it was just kind of having that community with other people mainly um I don't know but it's grim. I imagine it's grown bigger now since when it started, which is like really amazing to hear. Um, but back then, it was kind of a small society, so like starting off and finding its feet, but it was like a really valuable thing to be part of. Yeah, it's like got a whole last committee now, and like oh, awesome. <laughs> it's just really cool. <laughs> um, I think that takes us perfectly on to the next section of like activism campaigns and stuff. So, you've both mentioned uh, campaigns that were going on at the time, so the women's campaign and also the campaign to get. LGBTQ plus flags around. So if um, Titi, you could start with sort of describing some of the main issues that affected black students or campaigns that you were a part of and what kind of work you did, that would be great. Oh. Um, so I, I mentioned that I was FITS organizer for the Women's Speak Out campaign. And I think um, at the time there was um, real topics in and around like date rape. That was a really, I don't know if it's as kind of, um, pertinent as now as, as then but there was a real um dialogue in and around date rape and how common it was and I think there had actually been like an adverse experience um local to Cambridge and so I think that actually spurred a degree of activism unfortunately I think oftentimes um it, it takes one kind of horrific story to amplify um, a need I guess it's it's comparable to say George Floyd then making people really step up in being explicit about how they feel about the Black Lives Matter campaign for instance um, and so um, Emma Makefield who kind of sparked it she actually went to Oxford and she did a campaign initially in Oxford and then she came over to Cambridge and um, trying to kind of galvanized uh, people to join here and she kind of had um, college heads to kind of man those there so if you go on like the website you'll see like Fitz and Homerton and all the other colleges um had theirs as well and uh I think that that date rate kind of conversation sparked the campaign but the whole concept of the campaign in allowing women to kind of write their statements on them I actually think if you bear with me one second I'm, I'm actually in my bedroom I think I actually have 
one of the campaign like flyers weirdly oh, wow. on the vision board <laughs> if i can find it but if you can see here on her face it simply says loud and proud and so this is one of the, the fits images um and so it just enabled women to write whatever they pleased i can remember um lecturers wrote women in stem um someone else wrote i'm not there my hair another person said uh, say no to domestic violence etc etc and so the whole premise of the campaign was to allow women to kind of control their bodies and control the statements and the things that they were defined by and what were important to them so that was just really encouraging and it really brought around quite a few uh, women and I can remember being in lectures and obviously not everyone is writing lecture notes during lectures let's be honest and I can remember sitting behind some of the guys and they were on Facebook and that week the, the campaign was really trending because Facebook was trending then uh, I'm not sure if that's the platform now but I can remember seeing you know a campaign that I've been instrumental in arranging you know seeing other students male students as well which was quite a big deal um, just to see that they were seeing it and liking it and commenting and that was really cool and I can remember we were in the local Cambridge paper and yeah that was really really exciting and then um, yeah it was nice to get so many people involved um, in the hundreds so that was super cool um, in terms of the fly network they were doing incredible things and I don't want to discredit anything they were doing by trying to summarize it um, but yeah I definitely think that in hindsight I probably could have gotten involved in even more I did find my degree incredibly demanding um but uh yeah I, I wonder like i guess all the things that have happened with uh black lives matter and george floyd or brianna taylor etc happened in the summer while i guess uni was in recess but it'd be quite exciting to see how um how cambridge will take that on and how and i haven't seen anything maybe they have um but how they would be so much more respondent because i can remember when ore and chelsea came through and the whole um stormzy scholarship thing happened it was quite a, oh my gosh this is so explicitly black wow you know and, and it's wonderful that those things are normalized i can remember like running to uh, one of my friend's room and being like oh my days like you know peter's on bbc news talking about being black you know and it was really quite it was almost revolutionary which is so pathetic because it should be normalized but um yeah i think i think it's uh yeah it's exciting to see uh, so much change in a short proximity savannah and i graduated i guess three years and a couple months ago so yeah it's, it's exciting to see how much change has happened in that short time um i'm i wouldn't say that i, I was the greatest act activist in my time but i definitely know that there were some fantastic campaigns uh fly being one of them as well yeah it's amazing thank you so much Liv savannah you could just sort of do the same and talk about like the main issues at the time and like what you were involved in. Yeah, um, so as I was saying before in 2000, yes, one of the big campaigns that I was been involved in was kind of the general campaign by I think the um, CTO of Keith Diley to try to get some flags or just I think it was generally try to get some kind of recognition of LGBT history month by colleges like individually um, which was Quite a roller coaster. So, I was the LGBT advocates when we first were trying to push this campaign, and I got a lot of pushback from the college about like having a flag at all. And I think initially, um, I, I emailed someone senior at Fitz repeatedly, and kind of just had my emails completely ignored um, until I think Varsity ran an article kind of about the progress of various colleges, and I said in the article. Williams has not responded to me. They've essentially been blocking any of this from happening. And I said, yeah, specifically this person has been ignoring me and they don't want anything to do with it. Literally, like, <laughs> the morning that I published, my director studies was like, oh, I read that. Like, that was great that you said that. And then I got an email from the person who's been ignoring me for months saying, oh, you know, uh, just seeing your article would be great to, like, discuss. Call someone out. And then, like, everyone's aware. Then, like, oh, dang it, we need to do something. So, Eventually, I managed to get, I think this was, I think, I think it must have been like at the start of my third year, maybe, I managed to get them to, they wouldn't put a flag on a pole or anything, but what they did do was they let us hang it on the fit sign at the back of the college, and I think uh, the fit signs are the back and the front entrances of the college, so the one that's on Huntington Road, and then the other one that goes towards like town. They let us like, hang our jeans like there, and that stayed there for I think it was at least a week. 
And that was like the first time they'd ever done anything like that. So that was amazing. Um, they also let me arrange an uh, LGBT formal, which, which I think, I don't know if it's still continuing, but I, there was for a while a kind of Hill College formal, which started at Fitz, and then a few of the other Hill Colleges took over the LGBT formal for the Hill Colleges. I think um, Mary Edwards did it the year after us, but I kind of did that for the first time, and that was kind of well received. But like generally, it was quite difficult convincing a lot of the colleges to have anything to do with LGBT achievement at all. Some of them would put out like, you know, like a statement on their Twitter saying, oh, you know, happy LGBT history month. And that was kind of it. Um, some colleges, and now <laughs> about the recording, I, I wouldn't say, but one college in particular um, really did not want an LGBT flag on their portal. And so simply passed a resolution in like, amongst the trustees, which meant that the flag could only fly the Union Jack or the college flag, and that was it, like nothing else could be flown. Um, and they passed it specifically because the student body tried to get them to put the ring the flag up, um, and they were just adamantly against it. A lot of colleges refused to acknowledge it, put it anywhere, or to put out any kind of statement. And it, I think it, it really maybe like the year after I left, um, Fitz flew the flag, I think that was in 2018, they finally like, let the flag actually fly on the mast. Um, the LGBT officer then managed to make that happen. And I think from about 2018, most of the colleges did agree to either fly the flag. If they couldn't do that, just to do something to acknowledge it, like something in public. Um, but before that, it was quite a push to get them to do anything, really. And it was just kind of more of a nuisance issue to them. They didn't really see the need for it. And unfortunately, Cambridge it's a great place, but it can be quite traditional and in some parts of it quite stuffy. And so any kind of change could take a long time. I think that campaign in it of itself had taken a few years before I even got there to get off the ground for anyone to do anything. Um, so it took public pressure and kind of literally a coordination where there was girls to be for each college was like emailing and pushing senior members of the college to try to get this to happen. And eventually, you know, they say they did. Um, and that was, you know, that was quite an amazing thing. But it, it took a while because change was slow. Very, that's, very yeah, that's amazing. That's the thing about Cambridge. It's quite fragmented, all the different colleges, so many yeah. different like levels to getting things changed. But it's amazing to see that that was able to happen. Um, mm. Moving on to like role models, Titi, you mentioned like a few ACS presidents who have done amazing things. Were there any black students during your time at Cambridge who kind of inspired you or motivated you or even mentored you while you're trying to navigate Cambridge as a black woman? Yeah, I definitely, um, I definitely think so. Um, I don't know if their names will mean anything to you, but uh, Priscilla Mensah um, was amazing. I think, um, Oh my goodness. Okay. So names are, have left me. So even hearing Huntington Road, I was like, oh my days. I forgot about that. I even called the formals dinners. So, you know, I don't know what they're referring <laughs> to. But I know that she was a really instrumental part of KUSU. I can't remember if she was KUSU president or something like that. But I can remember her being the first black woman of something. And wherever mm -hmm. that first black woman is attached, I'm here for it. And I can remember just being incredibly proud. Um, and uh, she really um, governed that and really um, was was um, a role model for me, for sure. Um, also, just a lot of great presidents. So Heather was president in my first year, Nissi in my second or third year. Can't really remember. Um, but yeah, there were really great, um, great role models before and after me. If you see what like Chelsea and Aurea have done, for instance, they were in the year below me, but they've done incredible things. And I think last summer I had gone to one of the Apple workshops and their, um, their Chelsea is speaking on the book, taking up space and doing it so well. And it was just really cool to see how different people have utilized uh, their experiences. And I definitely um, account the growth in the number of black students to visually seeing um, representations of themselves you know it's encouraging I think it's quite isolating to step in the space and it just looks like you're not welcome so it's I can imagine you know 10 years ago it would have been harder and, and 10 years later it's easier so I definitely am grateful for those people and when I first came to visit Fitz um, when I had my pool interview I went into again I'm going to call it the bar I'm sure that's not what it's called can't remember 
um, the place where you get the paninis. Uh, remind me, Savannah, what's it oh, called? It's the cafe. cafe. Oh, I love oh, that yeah, was easy. Cafe. Everyone loves uh, that place. Yeah. <laughs> the cafe. And um, there was a student, uh, a black female student who studied law. And she essentially was just like, yeah, like she was in her third year, but she was like, yeah. Her name was Simi. It just slipped my mind, but come back now. And she was also Nigerian, also Yoruba. I'm Yoruba, I'm Nigerian. Um, <laughs> studied law. <laughs> And so it just kind of felt like, oh, you know, you're on your third year, you're on your way out, I'm coming in. This is like a nice exchange, you know. Um, and also it was right after I had, you know, two really challenging interviews. Um, and so that kind of thing is just really reassuring. And you kind of come to forget that um, other cultures are just used to, they don't even have to like rely on their race to feel comfortable. It's like, oh, you're from Suffolk. I'm from Suffolk as well. You know, there definitely wasn't anyone there from Brixton, but you know what I mean? It was just nice to, for a moment, savor that experience of, oh, okay, cool. You see me, I see you. We understand that. So even though they might not, you know, be like, okay, role models in the conventional sense, I guess reflections is one thing that I definitely am grateful for. And Simi, Priscilla, Heather, Nissi, Erin are all instances of that. Yeah, I can definitely agree with like seeing reflection because I remember the first day that I moved into Fitz, I was also poor to Fitz. So the first time I ever went there was when I was moving in. Wow. I walked out of my accommodation block and I saw a black girl she saw me, she was like, she was with her family, she was like, mom, stop, my sister is there, she was like, Tolu, Tolu, there's a black girl, it was the oh, funniest oh. moment ever, but Honestly. we had an interview with her um, just yesterday or the day before, so it's just very nice to like see someone that looks like you and you feel comfortable and kind of safe as well, yeah. um, and also this year there's two other black girls doing law at FITS in my year, so we have oh, all wow. our visions together, it's just amazing to like wow. have a community in that way. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, but Savannah, what about you? Did you have any role models during your time at Cambridge? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know about the term role model specifically, but I will say that there were like a lot of other students who, like I think, kind of using the term that you use, like kind of reflect and seeing them in these positions, like it's really amazing that they're there, and I think they felt great. But I can think of, I can't remember his position. I think he might have been. No, I can't remember. I can't remember what he was. I don't know if you remember this name, Kibi. There was um, he was president of something, Amite Doku. He, like, yeah, I think of... he was Kusu Press. Was he Kusu Press? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. He was for a while. He did like lots of big names. I think he went on to be a U.S. president as well, or speaker. Or something. Yeah. He's doing something like that now, and he was like in a lot of high positions. It was awesome to see, like, yeah, you know, a black guy. The black is a good one. Yeah. yeah, he did. He did so much, like constantly on campaigns and like a very visible mm -hmm. part of Kusu and that was like really amazing um really really good to see that um what part of what I was saying earlier about like theatre there were like several students who like really kind of pushed the boundary and like made sure that there was some kind of representation in theatre so yeah last year you know I can't remember her last name there was um Lola Lusami you uh, kind of see Lola like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, published she's, like, as well yeah, she yeah. does that. But she was like wow. acting. That's great. She she acted, like she did loads of things. She was in part of fly, part of skis, like did all kinds of stuff and she was like really, really amazing. Um and it was just so awesome to see like her doing that and to see that representation and see that happening. Um and this is like kind of slightly less about students, but even more in terms of like courses and how different Cambridge courses kind of addressed kind of black spaces. I remember there being a huge push in like the English department to have something that wasn't just like to have an English curriculum that didn't just focus on like the 1800s white horses. So eventually, mm -hmm. I think it was nearly 2000, um, they finally introduced the post colonial paper, which is still a debatable term because you have the issue with everything that's from a former Commonwealth country that's been passed on the 60s, just labeled post colonial. Um, and you can know everything before that, that's still a big issue. But you had some kind of representation, yet also if you weren't white, you were in fact an Asian, and that was amazing. And I think, I imagine she's still there. There was um, a really, really great fellow lecturer, um, Priyam Bada Gopal. She's, she's been in the news all the time. Um, but she like, really, really pushed that paper, as a few other fellows, and they kind of made it a priority because you just did not study anyone who wasn't English. 1800s, it's very difficult to get out of that one space and get out of the idea that 
anything that wasn't of this particular time wasn't really valuable in this literature. Um, and so even like within the course, it was really amazing to have that. And I also think, and this is kind of like maybe answering a question you posed earlier, but I, I remember there was also a big push to kind of decolonize quite a few uh, subjects. And I imagine that's still going on, but as it, there's a huge push in English, but yes, it was, I think, first English, but that was quite a large campaign. That was, I wasn't really involved with it, but I was aware of it. And again, their view was like, don't ignore contributions that are more modern and later and usually involve like not necessarily like basically non-white authors and writers and academics and so you should be included as well or history being a space where you study like a particular history ignore the British Empire anything to do with that and nothing of that is actually explored so it's really great to have like a lecturer like that to have people kind of pushing that as well and that was quite a big thing quite an amazing thing to see in the students particularly. Yeah, I'm an um, education officer on the BME campaign, so my role is essentially about decolonising Cambridge and decolonising the curriculum. So that definitely is a big, like, a really important campaign. And the past education officer, like Lola, when she was doing all her de decolonised work, it's definitely been built on. So it's nice to see that it was something that was quite important, important yeah. to you as well. And on the topic of change, it would be really interesting to hear from both of you about one thing or several things that you didn't think would change in Cambridge but have or things that have surprised you about change in Cambridge? So you know, Savannah if you want to start. Um, well I mean already having like two BME offices at Vicks is quite a big change. I actually remember I think in second or third year there was like a time when they were considering getting rid of the BME office or I can't remember if you remember the CD but they there was like they were considering removing it from the JCR, the position, the argument being the budget was low and there aren't that many PME students. So that's wow. also from the point. We spend no money. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I just remember that being a thing. And I think there was a vote and it was, it was eventually the vote like retained it. But I remember it coming up. I think it must have been like late second year or early third year because I think it was when I was on the JCR and it was just like really, really weird. Um, so it's like amazing to see like TV and offers is just it's just generally great there's so many more students who are like who look like all those who are back and if other minorities it's nice that it's actually slowly becoming more representative of like the general population in the UK. <laughs> um it's really nice to see that development, especially like in the last two years. But then again, you see when you said like there were ten of us in the RK hall, I didn't even realise there was ten of us. I thought there was like five, like legitimately like yeah, definitely less than 10. I went over that in my head. And yeah, like, yeah, I was like, I thought there yeah, were like five. five of us. Like, ten. Like, five. When you said really? that, I was so shocked because there's like eight in our year. So I was like, no, but the 10 in the whole now. college. So like, oh, that's um, it. Yeah. Yeah, the whole college. So yeah. like, yeah. master's students as well. There's a lot in our more. Cohort, there's like four, I think, in our cohort. Mm. Like, there's us two, Maxine, Che, and I can't think of anyone else. I think it was just us four in our cohort, right? Yeah, there were loads of master's students, though. That's, that's what's in my head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was sorry. it. I think we we're the four. If we've missed yeah. anyone out, we apologise. I'm but... <laughs> so sorry. No, oh, one more person. Oh, one more person. There's one more guy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Casey. Casey. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I remember Casey. But like, it was hard. So it's, it's great that there's already like so much more representation in Fitz alone and then in Cambridge. Like, that's it's awesome. And it's great to hear that Fuse has grown. Like, it's so much of a bigger thing. That's like, really awesome to hear because it's definitely an important space. It's just like really just great that that's growing and becoming an actual thing and that representation is actually increasing in here which is fantastic. I think to be honest I don't think I've um, kept in touch enough to actually be able to evaluate how much the change has been. Um, the last time I went to Cambridge was on the 1st of July 2017 which is when I graduated. <laughs> it's um, my birthday. <laughs> oh wow uh, yeah, that was a big day for me too. <laughs> but um yeah i think uh from what i've seen like online and in the news it's great to see that the the bame black and brown um student body has grown so much it's great to see that um efforts towards access are being made or even if it's being made from cambridge or from the outside in from the stormsies or whoever supporting access for black students that's fantastic 
Um, I'm not sure where the repatriation movement has happened, but I know that Ore was a big part of trying to repatriate the Jesus crop fall back to Benin or wherever it was. And I really thought that nothing would happen with that. I thought, wow, that's just so, I mean, Cambridge is very ossified, very entrenched in some of the things that they hold dear. So um, even the fact that that was um, an active movement is really indicative of a changing times. So I thought that was awesome. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know what the numbers look like now, but I think just, uh, I, I personally know two um, black females who are on their way to Cambridge this year, one of them fits. So Tolu, I will be letting you know who she is. Um, so yeah, it's just exciting to see that that access is, is more uh, apparent. Um, but in terms of like tangible change, I don't know. I think I have to be there to really see it and feel it. Um, I have been reached out to a couple of times by like, uh, like the fits people i don't know what you call them um to kind of just write stuff or just to be interviewed and it's nice that that representation is being engaged with i can remember um being asked to do a couple things that i kind of said no to because it's easy to kind of feel like the token black girl that they want to put on a promotional video um but it's nice to know that um that isn't the case and that is actually integrated um, and I think the proof of that will really be in you, you guys' experiences and how tangible that is because it's, it's all good and well writing these numbers down but it's all about how you guys feel your experiences have been shaped so I think um, it'd be difficult to suggest that there's this you know massive change that I'm really proud of um, but I hope that you guys experience that. Moving on to like the future um, from how or from what you've seen of Cambridge so far, is there anything, Savannah, that you'd want to change about Cambridge or you'd like to see change? Um, I mean, you know, generally I've always picked keen that there are more, there's more representation from like different socioeconomic classes. So, you know, more states or students in, um, which has always been a problem at Cambridge, all the kids have always very good at it. And I think, you know, this year we could be interesting with the whole complete exam fiasco. But that also counts meaning that actually there is, I think, it's meant to be more safer students than before. So you have that greater representation. So I think if there's anything I just want to see change, I think it's already changing. And I think it's really good to see like less, having less orders which kind of only take on a certain type and kind of refuse to consider anything else. And so kind of like expanding opportunity for everyone across the board. Again, it's an issue with the way the college system is set up. So Colleges are quite a you know, separate entity because it's still good and encouraging to see kind of that increasing representation just across the board. More working class students, more state students. I think that's a really important issue for Cambridge to tackle, and it's good to see that something is happening in that area. And to awesome. see you kind of touched on like inclusion and making sure that the black students at Cambridge feel comfortable so is there anything along those lines that you'd like to see change at Cambridge in the future? Yeah I think it's difficult um, I think it's difficult for these things to um, these changes strategy for changing culture is quite difficult and I recognize that, that the issues that made my experience maybe sometimes a bit awkward or uncomfortable, they transcend the, the four walls of Fitzwilliam or even Cambridge. They are entrenched in British and society more generally. So I really feel as though, um, I feel as though it, it's, it's more than just saying, oh, you know, let's get, you know, a, a BAME kusu or let's get more, um, black faces ultimately i think it's it's the hearts and minds of people and that's quite a challenging thing to do but i do feel like um if a college is explicitly endorsing um the desire to bring on more black students and it's not just the diversity and inclusion kind of uh, checkbox um i think that's meaningful um like for instance now like i would hope that there is a um, increase annually on the number of comprehensive students and like black and brown students that come to Cambridge. Um, and, I, and I hope that that's done in a non like positive discrimination way, you know, what a way that, that that's meaningful because there's nothing worse than thinking, oh, you know, or other cultures thinking that you're there because it ticks a box or other cultures thinking that you're there because there's a quota to fill. Um, and so I think that, um, 
I think that it's it's a difficult one. Like now, for instance, in in your year, how many how many black students were in your matriculating year, Tolu or Deanna? I think the f yeah at Fitz and then Cambridge wide, the figure was ninety one. But I think ACS so what collected was the that. Fitz? What did eight. you say the Fitz was? Eight. 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 Out of okay. Double R. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that's an improvement over yeah. three years for sure. But then also, when it's eight out of 150, and that's at Fitz that has the highest number usually. But I also felt like there were certain occasions where, you know, you could tell that there is, there it is, we are trying to make Black people feel more welcome here. So there was the occasional, oh, Titty, are you really interested in this opportunity as a law student? I thought, but I actually got the worst in my supervision essay. So why are you picking me? Do you just want to say that I'm the black one who looks good on a promo <laughs> video? You know? Um, so yeah, I think it's difficult to make strategy around race without making the person feel like they are, you know, a poster child. Mm. I don't know. I don't have an answer. That's, that's I don't know. But um, <laughs> I do think that, um, I just do think that, and it's, it's difficult because the nature of systems is you can't just allow it to emerge organically because it just won't as well, you know? So I don't have an answer, but I do think that <laughs> it's nice to see it's growing and um, yeah, that's, 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 that's me. No, that was a great answer. And I think just to finish this all off, I know we've kind of kept you here for a while, but if you just have like an anecdote that sort of sums up your experience of Cambridge as a black student or just a student more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, um, mm, an anecdote. Mm. I think fundamentally um i think there's something very powerful in being able to be a walking dismissal of what the world perceives blackness as oftentimes um i've entered a lot of rooms um whereby uh the assumption is you know that you know if anyone is going to be a russell group or an oxbridge that it probably won't be me and i think there's something very powerful of recognizing that i attained those grades i did the work and i graduated and i am a, a walking contradiction of a, what what you see all the time posted on the bbc or or what the statistics might say and so though i think some of my experiences were a bit adverse or a bit challenging or I kind of look at Warwick and be like, oh, that would have been fun. Um, you know, I, you know, I did go to uh, their Afro, Afro Fest and I came back with the greatest withdrawal symptoms ever because I felt like I was back I home. I feel like that is the, I feel like that's the universal, like, black experience Uni that came universal. I, I should have gone to Warwick. <laughs> yes, because there are social deficits, you know. I remember the yeah. first time I went to a club and I heard Robbie Williams and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and then it was followed by Spice Girls and so I proceeded to understand that there were some concessions that I had to make but um, I think it's really special and I feel like as um, I might have been the odd thumb you know and maybe there are a couple other odd thumbs in the equation but I think it's important that someone starts it because um, it is a domino effect and I do go to, um, I interviewed for instance, I did some mock interviews at Brampton Academy um, some years back and you know there were a lot of students who were like oh wow so you actually went to Cambridge and I, yes I absolutely did and I did so well as well so um, I think it's very encouraging and um, even when I saw Tolly message me on LinkedIn I was like yes you go girl you know because it's important and um, so yeah I don't, don't know if I have an anecdote but I definitely think that um, it's really encouraging to see more and more faces and I saw Simi in 2016 and uh, Tolu people will see you, Leona people will see you in years to come and uh, to know that, that that is in some ways being a trailblazer and really encouraging those coming after so yeah. Amazing thank you so much and Savannah do you have anything? It doesn't even have to be an anecdote, <laughs> kind of down that same line. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't, again, I, I don't think I have any, you know, really anecdotes either, but um, kind of echoing what you know, was saying, it's just, I think just, yeah, being that person to like go around and say, yeah, I, I came from this background, like, this is me, so what is really important? And, you know, I'm in a career, again, where it is, like, very white and very skewed against people who are any kind of minority and it's important to, to be there and to say that, yeah, I also went to university, we're doing the same thing, we're at the same level, like, 
you know, my background doesn't, isn't any kind of barrier to anything. It's just my background and that's what it is. And I get messages with people all the time on like LinkedIn and also just people just manage to find my email somehow and just be asking me about things or I, you know, I've done quite a few talks on like law at Cambridge and uh, around other universities and in general and again people have they asked me, I think I once went back to my form of sixth form and someone said, you know, what is Cambridge like? Like, would I feel uncomfortable there as someone from, as someone who's black, would I be uncomfortable there? As someone who's black and working class, like, is that a place for me? And I think part of kind of our role, having been at Cambridge, is to say, yeah, of course this is a place for you. Like, can it be quite traditional? Can it be quite white? Can it be, you know, maybe kind of middle class, but it can still aim anything, but it doesn't mean it can't be your space, it doesn't mean it isn't your space, but it is your space by you going there and you find these interactions and having these experiences and you realizing that actually the stereotypes you have in your head don't mean that that is what the space is. You kind of move that space and that's, you know, what societies like views and my girls kind of show you that you can go somewhere and just create that space and then that's yours and the other spaces are still open to you, they're, they're still yours. It's nothing in your background as a barrier to what you can experience. And that's, I think, a really important message that we all shy away from applying to Cambridge for, which is, you know, a terrible thing. So the fact that, you know, the four of us can have this conversation and talk about experiences and you know that we all come to you know, the same university and then go out wherever we're going to go, and we've had our diverse backgrounds. That's, that's an amazing thing, which I hope other applicants and other students that other universities see and kind of take away from because it's, it's important to have this representation. I think it's really awesome. Thank you so much, both of you, for speaking with us. It's honestly been amazing to speak to both of you and just like hearing about your experiences and just meeting you both um, yeah. as FITS alumni. It's been great. Yeah. Wishing you guys such success. Um, yeah. So, you guys are just going into second year? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. <laughs> You guys will, oh, yeah, fantastic. Okay, cool. Well, well done for embracing. I mean, at least I, I didn't do as much as you guys are doing now. So, you know, well done for doing that. Make sure you guys find balance, make time for rest, and all that wonderful stuff. But yeah, lovely speaking to you both. Yeah, Thank you so much.